So you may have heard the tale of the spread of Christianity being possible because of the Roman Empire. That a world leader such as Alexander the Great would unify the language and speech. Of course, he was a Macedonian. And then the Roman Empire would take over and they would extend their influence and bring peace to the empire. Of course, peace by their sword. <laughs> and they would build roads, these roads that still exist to this very day, the same routes. And because of all of this Pax Romana, missionaries could go all over the kingdom and declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, in his eternal decrees and plans, saw fit that the world would be shaped in such a way that when Christ came and then his church was birthed in the world, that it would spread through the empire. Of course, some former Roman emperor thought he had built this for his own glory, and God said, no, I got something else in plan. I know what I'm doing. You think you know what you're doing? I know what I'm doing. And interestingly enough, because the Jewish people had been dispersed from Israel, you know, Zion was supposed to be the focus of their worship and their existence. They were to occupy that land and to, I mean, it was promised to them from Abraham already that that land was supposed to be theirs. It would be the fruit of the benefit of obedience to the covenant. But other nations came in and dispersed them from all over the place. The sword would be called in to bring havoc upon the people. So Jewish synagogues sprung up all over the Roman Empire. Wherever the Jewish people had been dispersed, if they had a large enough community, a synagogue would pop up. So not only was it language and Roman roads and peace, it was the fact that all these synagogues existed in all these cities. Isn't this interesting? And we know, it because it's well-worn material, that when the Apostle Paul, now here, we're following him on a second missionary journey, when he went to a town, what's the first thing he would do? Find the local synagogue. Why do that? Because the Bible's there. <laughs> and because he could talk to people who have a framework for his worldview. And he would have discussions with them about the scriptures. And, of course, every time he would have these dialogues in the synagogues, there would be implications. He would be talking about the Messiah of the Old Testament, the promises that God had to send an anointed one. And he would mention Jesus Christ. He would mention John the Baptist. He would mention the promises made to Israel. And all of a sudden, one person would say, wait a minute. What are you trying to say? Did we miss out on something? And boy, none of us want to miss anything. And then some words might have been exchanged, then someone took it personal, and then some words got exchanged, and then rights. <laughs> People getting really upset that Paul would make the assertion that the promised anointed one of the Old Testament had come in the person of Jesus Christ. And now Israel was going to look differently than they had ever imagined. Well, that was his technique. Go to a place where the people know the Bible, can talk about the Bible. If there is no Bible, if there is no synagogue, we'll go out to a river. We'll find people praying. We'll go to where the philosophers are having their discussion. We'll go to the marketplace. I'll have a conversation with anyone. I can start an entry point on the importance of the gospel and God's plan to redeem the world, pretty much give me a topic, I'll be able to get Jesus in there. So, but the synagogue is clearly the number one tool that Paul is using to advance the gospel. So we're in Acts chapter 18 now, and wanted to look at a little snippet of his involvement in the city of Corinth. And this is what 18.1 says. After these things, Paul departed from Athens. And what were those things? He gave a great presentation before the leaders of that community. And he told them about a sovereign God who is now calling all men to follow Jesus Christ. 
And some people mocked him. Some people said, well, that was a really stirring presentation. Thank you. I'll, I'll like to listen to that again sometime. And then some people believed and followed Paul and became a disciple of Jesus Christ. So that's those things in Athens. And then he went to Corinth. Okay, Corinth. You know, we first started this series calling it the Day of the Holy Spirit. And I've been saying I wanted to be a proper Pentecostal Presbyterian. Of course, that just freaks people out. Those two words don't go together. Pentecostal Presbyterian. But I wanted to focus on the fact that Pentecost is the day of the announcement of the new covenant, that there's a new relationship that we have with the Lord by His Holy Spirit. And His Holy Spirit applying all to, to us the righteousness of Christ to those who believe is our true spiritual baptism, resurrection, and it's, it's our... It's our entry into the kingdom. You know, we are living in the kingdom right now of God. We're not just here visiting this earth to go to the kingdom. We're here bringing the earth to the kingdom. A little different perspective there, right? So, uh, but now he goes to Corinth, and we know if you have any understanding of the Pentecostal way of doing things, boy, do they depend on the book of First and Second Corinthians. They love those books. There's a lot of things that happen in those books where they say, hey, this is the things that the church should be doing. Sadly, from our perspective, and it's kind of a pretty open reading, most of the things that Paul does in the letters to the church at Corinth is to reprimand them and to say, you're doing it wrong. You're making it worse than if you ever started in the first place. I don't know if that makes sense, but he's saying this is a troubled church. So to be a Pentecostal Presbyterian means to rightly read the book of Acts and to rightly read the book of First and Second Corinthians. Now, here in Corinth, we have a city with a worldwide reputation. You will, find, uh, you will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy than in Corinth. This is a city, and if you look on the order of service, there's a little map there of the Greek, uh, southern portion of Greece and Corinth is right at this peninsula and Corinth figured out that they could build a rolling ramp across the isthmus so that sailors wouldn't have to go all the way around that the, the Cape of Greece and they would cut off time and make their trip shorter and it was worth it for them to sail into this inside channel and to avoid going all the way around. And so Corinth was a huge hub of economic activity. And it was a place where all the sailors loved to go. And when I say sailors loving to go someplace, just think of all the negative connotations of what sailors from all over the world would do in communities where there were thousands of priestesses who were ready to receive your worship of the pagan gods. So Corinth was a town, we would just say, it's Sin City. And the uh, ancients would say, not every man can handle going to Corinth. It was that type of location. And interestingly enough, we see that there is a synagogue there. Verse 2, speaking of Paul, he found a certain Jew named Aquila born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. There was a lot of information in that verse. First of all, there's a Jew named Aquila, and we don't really have any background on him. No, there's no backstory, so there's a possibility that Theophilus, to whom the book of Acts is written, kind of knows this guy. Well, what happens here is this guy is originally from Pontus, and if you remember Acts chapter 2, when they did a catalog of everyone who was in Jerusalem that day and heard them speaking their dialect, Pontus is one of the regions that's mentioned there. And he has come from Italy, more specifically from Rome, because we get the notation that the Emperor Claudius made, commanded the Jews to leave that city. 
Now, what's really interesting about that reference is that Roman historians have written about the very same thing. And the Roman historian Suetonius, who's writing around 120, discusses Claudius in his reign. And Claudius reigns from 41 to 54. So if you're looking for a time frame for when Paul is in Corinth, we're talking the late 40s, the early 50s. And what Suetonius documents in his Annals of Claudius, this is from Book 25, we read this interesting quote. Since the Jews constantly made disturbances at the instigation of Crestus, he expelled them from Rome. Now, you're a historian and you read this very interesting quote that there was a time when Claudius was in Rome and he said the Jews are creating such a disturbance here because of this Crestus guy I'm going to tell him get. And so you think, well, let's search through, this, the, through the annals of all the scriptures and find out who this Crestus guy is. And everyone begins to speculate, well, Crestus is a form of saying Christ. This is a reference to Jesus Christ and how the Jews kept on getting upset about people trying to make Jesus the Christ. Now, not every scholar agrees with that because that seems too convenient that some Roman is writing about the influence of Jesus Christ in Rome at this time of the Christian church. But to get around the notion that it's most likely a reference to Christians and Jews having debates and disagreements in Rome and the, the, the emperor saying, I've had enough with this. All you guys just go. You're turning my city into turmoil. And that Suetonius would write about it and that Luke would also document it. So this is, I've got the exact thing written here in Latin, but I can't read it. But basically, you can see from our English that there was the impulsion for Cresto because of tumult, and from Roma, expulsed. They were expelled. So this is this interesting connection between the history of the church and the growth of Christianity that didn't just necessarily happen because of the uh, apostles going on their mission trips. Some people were in Jerusalem from Pontus. Aquila somehow heard the story uh, on Pentecost. This had filtered all the way through the Roman Empire into Rome. Christians and Jews started having debates about who Jesus Christ was, and it created, it created debates. It created problems. Of course, you remember the famous line that when the missionaries entered into one town, they said, these are the people who have turned over the world. That Christianity was making inroads in all kinds of places, and not necessarily only singly by the Apostle Paul. So verse 3, so because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. Once again, Aquila and Priscilla, they were in Rome. Somehow they identified that maybe with this expulsion of Claudius that they should leave. Maybe they were a part of the problem. Maybe they got tagged as being instigators. He's called a Jew. We don't know if he's a converted Jew yet. But we know that they're coming into the orbit of the Apostle Paul, and we find out that uh, Aquila and Priscilla become the closest friends of Paul. And in fact, as the missionary team continues, and their next stop is in Ephesus, it's Priscilla and Aquila that go with Paul, and Timothy and Silas, they stay behind. It's a really interesting development. And so what's kind of interesting here in this little section of Acts 18 is there's a lot of um, combat going on. But then there's a lot of God providing comfort and strength through that time. And you see that in the personal relationships that are, that are identified here. And of course, um, it's been long believed and taught that you couldn't just be a rabbi. Uh, you needed to have a profession on the side. And um, I don't know why the Apostle Paul, who was Saul, who came from Tarsus, who probably came from a pretty wealthy family, learned how to make tents or canopies, 
or pergolas. I don't know exactly what his tent making work was, but he knew how to do it. And Priscilla and Aquila had the same craft. And so he's here pretty much uh, without his mission team in Corinth. And he's like, I got to earn a job <laughs> and I got to pay for the bills. So he's going to work with them. And you can just see through their conversations, through his discipleship, that Priscilla and Aquila become significant to the Christian church. A man and a wife gifted in ministry is a powerful thing. And I'm, and I'm thankful for that from personal experience. So, verse 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and he persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Because we've learned already at this time that the Jews were in the synagogue, of course, and there were plenty of God-fearers that loved and were intrigued by the Jewish faith. Verse 5, when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. Christus? Hey, this is a very interesting verse. There happens to be some textual criticism about it. What seems to, hap what seems to be happening here is that now that uh, Silas and Timothy have come from Macedonia, they've probably come with offerings to help support the mission trip. And so now Paul isn't required to be tent making now, and that he's now full time preaching the gospel. He's, he's received some support. And why... Uh, it's a true blessing when the saints of God contribute to the work of the ministry. Um, I'm, I'm ready to make tents. I would probably be uh, a guy who cuts down trees or uh, trucks or shine shoes or something. But um, when you have the ability to full-time proclaim the God, there can be great effect. So what we also see here is that Paul will have as his agenda, again, to say that Jesus is the Messiah. That's the word Christ in the Greek, the Mashiach, the anointed one. There are 40 explicit Old Testament passages that speak of the anointed one. He could go to any of them and say, we have this figure in the Old Testament. He's called the anointed one. He's called the Mashiach. He's the Christ. Let's talk about who this person is. And we can do that right now. If you take your order of service and you look at your call to worship today, which is one of the 40 references to the anointed one. And of course, there's plenty more typological discussions of the Messiah and the work that the Messiah would bring. You don't need to only lean on the phrase Mashiach. But here you can look at Psalm 17 and and the Apostle Paul could go in the synagogue and say, let's look at this particular passage. Yes, you have exalted me above those who rose against me. Who do you think that's talking about, guys? Well, that's David, you know, because he was the king, but people came against him. He says, yeah, I, I know someone like David who had people rise up against him. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations and sing to your name. Oh, so, so you think David was there singing among the Goyim? He was out there praising. Wasn't he supposed to only be in Israel? Wasn't his kingdom really just in Zion? But you've got him praising God among all, like the Philistines and the Canaanites? Because I know a person who's calling people from all over the world and is praising God for all the nations coming to me. I have, God has given him the nations. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast, steadfast love to his anointed. There it is. There's this anointed one. There's his Mashiach. Who, to whom does God give great salvation to his king? I know a king. I know a king who's exalted to the right hand of God. He is the anointed one. He is the one who is, can declare God's chesed, his steadfast love. Who in the Old Testament could guarantee all of God's love? Do you remember what we read in Ezekiel today? Man, if you don't live righteous, your blood is on your head. If you repent, you can come back. But you've, people are going to die because of their iniquity, but I'll still save them. But the, your blood is going to be on your head if you don't walk righteously. Well, here's a person who knows everything about God's abiding love. 
and to David and his offspring forever. So who, my Jewish brothers and sisters, who right now is from the line of David, who's ruling as a king among the nations, who's praising him at this very time? Can you tell me who that person is right now? Because I have a candidate. His name is Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, who was a son of David, who was raised above his oppressors, who was raised from the dead, and now sits at the right hand of God. And from there, he comes to judge the quick and the dead. All right, so Paul could have had these conversations all the time in the synagogues, and for some people, that became an uncomfortable proposition. And so we see in verse 6, but when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Such a powerful transition. And also a predictable one. What happens when you get into a fight, you don't like the other person? You go for the ad hominem you know, pejorative discussion. Oh, that person doesn't know how to wear his tunic right. And you just start going after things that don't matter in the conversation. Oh, I can say a lot of things right now about politics. But that's the way it normally goes, right? If you don't like what the person's saying, you attack the person. You vilify their name. You don't deal with their content. You don't deal with what they're saying. You just got to make yourself feel better by making the other person evil. That is uh, unchristian. We have to deal with the contents of the arguments. And so what Paul does is, is a recitation of what we read from Ezekiel 33 today. He says, your blood's on your own heads. I've done what I was supposed to do. I've been the watchman who stood on the wall who said that there's a sword coming upon you. And if you don't repent, you're going to be, you're going to perish. And I've done my duty, so I shake my clothes off at you. I don't want the stain. I don't want your virus on me. And uh, Nehemiah does the same thing, too, when they come to a, a time of repentance. they got to shake off the influence that was upon him. And so as I see Paul making, this is really the first time that he's done this in a synagogue. They've always come after him, and they've tried to beat him up. They jailed him. They whipped him a number of times. They looked for him and they couldn't find him. So they went out and beat someone else up just to beat somebody up. But this is the first time Paul has actually said, okay, I'm done. I've done this how many times and how many synagogues and this is all I get. And I'm using our scriptures and I'm using our traditions. And I'm not compromising on what the word says. And then to think, I'm going to the Gentiles. And to think where he said it, in Corinth, you want to talk about people? I don't know if that trade was good. <laughs> the people in Corinth had troubles, troubles. They, they made their leaders, they idolized leaders like they were most important. They were taking their brothers and sisters to court. They were living in, in immorality. Um... They were destroying the Lord's Supper. They were prejudiced against the poor, exalting the rich. It just, the letter is just an ongoing, when your worship services of outsiders come into your service, they think you're crazy because you're blabbing all over the place. It's just a constant letter of, you Gentiles, come on, be Christian. <laughs> you're acting too much like your culture. So I'm just, I just wonder if the trade was good. You leave the Jews and go to the Gentiles, boy, you just got yourself a whole set of headaches. But that's what happened. In verse 7, and I think this is comical. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. <laughs> How convenient. I'm out of here, and if you want to talk to me again, I'll just be about ten steps over here. <laughs> so, Justice's house, which is a really strong, manly name, uh, and I love the phrase, it was one who worshipped God, and that's what we want for all of our children, amen? Uh, his house was next to the synagogue, so he turned the house into a synagogue. 
House churches are repeatedly referenced in the scriptures. They weren't building buildings, with such nice buildings as we have today. They met in people's homes. Verse 8, then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. What a powerful thing that's happened in this community. There's been a lot of headache and, and harsh words, words expressed, but yet we have a ruler of the synagogue coming to faith. Now, I found something interesting about this verse. You know, uh, I want people to believe and be baptized. I want people to believe and to be baptized. Do you know how many times that phrase shows up in the book of Acts? The phrase, in a verse, believed and was baptized. How many times? How many times? That's it. Three times. There's a lot of people in the book of Acts who believe, and there's no subsequent baptism referenced. And we just kind of make conjectures and wonder. But... Uh, I also looked up, how many times does it say believed with their household? How many times is that mentioned? Three times. But I do know from the book of Acts that there were four households that were baptized. Cornelius, Lydia, the Philippian jailer, and now Crispus. And then Paul will say in Corinthians, and I also baptized the house of Stephanus. So there are five households that have household baptisms. And I know there's an ongoing discussion between the Baptists and the Presbyterians, but the Presbyterians, uh, on the matter of repetition and perspective, historical perspective, see the importance of having everyone in the household brought under the Lordship of Jesus Christ and to receive the sign of the covenant that they belong to Christ and his kingdom. Of course, people can always opt out, and sadly, there's ways to discipline people who opt out. It's not always as harsh as um, your blood upon your head, but we did read in, in 1 Corinthians 16 that, Jesus, that Paul would say, if you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're accursed. And I, I have to have a category for people who are baptized who grow up and don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that baptism isn't doing anything for them except that it set them apart as a member of the church, but if they back out of their membership, then they fall into another category. And it's the harsh category. So baptism is supposed to be a blessing and a benefit, but it can also be a curse if you walk away from it. To have a sign that says you belong to a holy people and a royal priesthood, and then to back out of that. So... Let me begin to conclude here. Verse 9. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid to speak. And do not keep silent. For I am with you. No one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. And so for all the trials that have taken place for the Apostle Paul. Um, and all the places that he's been to where riots and and tumult had uh, erupted at this particular location, God is saying, in this very wicked Gentile town, I want you to stay here. And why do I want you to stay in this particular town? Because it's such a great mess? No, because I have people that I have numbered among my elect, and I'm going to use you as the means to call them into the kingdom. And so we sort of speculated the other night about what that might look like. Some guy coming to hear Paul and mocking him at first. And then maybe a couple months later coming and giving it a little bit more thought. And then maybe a couple months later coming back and saying, you know what, I'm starting to get this now. And then by God's, all of that by God's grace, all of that by God's orchestration and decree and foreordination, bringing people to him. <coughs> So the joy of knowing that God calls a people to himself is that we don't have to compromise in how we present the gospel. 
Churches, uh, come on, we're all, we all remember the 90s. Churches just went Hollywood. They went theatrical production. They said, we got to compete against all the entertainments of the culture to get people into the churches. I was raised in a boring church. I was one of those kids who said, I don't want to go to church. All I do is listen to old people sing organ. <laughs> Pastor talking away, he's talking about stuff that I was raised in that. But all along I was discipled and I heard the word of God, and eventually it took root and it grew and turned me into the mess that I am today. <laughs> but I, I feel for the kids who think us is boring. But there's something being planted in all of them that they don't know yet, but boy, when it flowers. You don't know how grateful you're going to be. Because I went to the other churches. I went to the churches that when I first went there, I thought, man, these people love Jesus. Look. Look what they're doing. Look how they express themselves. Look at all the joy and excitement. And then I, after going like three weeks in a row, they do the same thing every week. This is no different than any other liturgy of a boring church. They just do the same thing every time. They just get more excited about it. And then they leave the church parking lot, and then they... <laughs> the Lord knows how to speak. So the beauty of this is to remind ourselves that, as Jesus said, I know my sheep, and I'm going to call. And you just present the word. You don't have to be Mr. Flash in the pan. You just need to be faithful. Love people. Be faithful. <laughs> that itself is hard enough. Verse 11, and he continued there a year and six months. That's like the longest he's ever stayed in any place. Now that prayer and that vision at night is so important for the Apostle Paul. And what I get is echoes from other passages of Scripture. Listen to what God had to tell Moses in Exodus 14, 13. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, whom you see today, speaking of the Egyptians, you will see again no more. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Don't worry, Paul, you're not going to be attacked. I know you got attacked a lot. I know you've got stripes on your body. But in this place... I want you here for a while because I'm calling people to myself. How about 2 Chronicles 20, verse 14? Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehazel, son of Zechariah, editing this a little bit. And he said, listen, all of you in Judah and all you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours. But God's, you will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Why would I ever dare to stand before a group of people if, if I didn't have any measure of understanding that this is all in God? Because I'd go home every day depressed that there wasn't some response, that I didn't make someone cry, that, I, that someone didn't walk the aisle at that message. I'm not doing it. God's doing it. Amen. And Paul would tell Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 8, Remember that Jesus Christ, the seed of David, oh, he's always doing synagogue talk, was raised from the dead according to my gospel. That's, that's the message. For which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains, but the word of God is not chained. Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. I, I will endure because I know God's going to call people to himself and he'll be glorified and I'll be, I'll be satisfied in that. So here's Corinth. I mean, 
to really understand it, we should go through both of those books, but not now. But let's be thankful that uh, God comes to us at the right time, intercedes, intervenes, and reminds us that it's not our fight, it's His, and He will accomplish His things, His good deeds for His pleasure and purposes. Let's pray.